<laughs> hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And today we got one of my all-time favorite rock and roll singers, Baden Todd Lewis from Toadies. He's had a the band's had a great career. He's a super talented guy, and I'm very excited to have him on the show. Um, he's most well known, as I said, for being the lead singer, guitarist, co-founder, and primary songwriter of the awesome. I'm, I don't. I don't. I feel bad saying this. Alt hard rock. I, I just. I mean, do I have to say a genre? An awesome rock band, Toadies. You know, if you look up all the things, yeah, it's like all, 10 categories. Hard rock. That, <laughs> I know. <it's, laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, you guys rock. It's, it's weird. That, You're kind of breaking up is. a little bit, but I, I think I followed that. Yeah, I, uh, it's, I, I, yeah, I just not grunge. I don't know. I don't even know what. <laughs> yeah, I know. I get it. Uh, I mean, I just the time period, but, you know. <laughs> but no, yeah, I get it. Uh, over the last 28 years, Toadies have released seven albums, including the platinum album Rubberneck, which they are currently touring. And I, you're gonna, are you going to play the full album at the show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's in very sequence, cool. Okay. Uh, top to bottom, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, they also host an annual music festival in Texas called Dia, Dia de los Toadies. Is that still going around? I know it was off for a few years. Oh, yeah. We did 10 years of that, and uh, we decided to, that that was – it's. It was just so much work, you know, it was a blast, imagine. but uh two day festival in the country is that's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> so uh, no, it's a ton of work. So uh, it, I'm really glad we did it. And, um, but 10 years of it, I mean, we're not ruling out of doing it again at some point, but yeah. uh yeah, it is, it is just a, it's a giant, you know, putting up fences and toilets and all from the bottom up, man. It was just a lot. Yeah, you don't think of all the uh, minutiae that's involved. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, it, there's also a very cool documentary online about the early years of the band, and I would encourage you to check it out. It's called Dark Secrets, the Stories of Rubberneck. Rubberneck. Uh, Vaden also owns an artist rehearsal complex in Fort Worth. It's called The Loop. Uh, if you are a band or an artist looking for rehearsal space in the area, please check them out online at the loop TX is in Texas.com and their rates are incredibly reasonable. And I say that sincerely. I looked at it. I was, wow, uh, man, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you for so much great music over the years, man. It's so cool. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to apologize for this one because there's a couple of questions that I'm asking you that I know you've heard before. So I'm going to just apologize up front for those. This is probably one of those. Okay. Interscope signs you guys on the strength of an EP you released in 93 called Pleather. How did that signing come about? Um, well, yeah, we uh, we did a uh, you know, some demos around Dallas-Fort Worth and uh, – uh, somebody that was starting what was to become uh, Wind Up Records. You remember Wind Up Records? I don't know, but uh, no, uh, I don't. They, Sorry. Yeah, when they started off, they were uh, Grass Records, and we were the first release. That was the first release on Grass Records. It went on to become Wind Up, and then Creed and some other bands came out on that on that label. But uh, at any rate, um, uh, one of our extended buddies from War just. Uh, I don't, I don't even know how we know this guy, but he was a, a rack jobber who put CDs on racks and he loved it. And he knew a guy that was working at Interscope who was, my understanding was the guy at Interscope was trying to become an A&R guy. So okay. he took our CD pleather and took it to Interscope and uh, got us signed and became our A&R guy. That's amazing, man. What so a, it's a weird, a cool... like, who you know situation. You know, it's always a little bit of that, right? Well, everything yeah, in the music business is like that. It's all who yeah. you know, it seems. Yeah, yeah. very much. Um, you know, it's funny because I watched some older videos of you. And it's, you. First of all, you look the same, you know, basically. And, well, thanks. Uh, but, it, but you were so young when you made that. It was I was like, how is this kid singing this? You, you're like, your voice is serious, man. You're a very powerful singer and, you know. Uh, and you could just tell you're given 110%. And I was just amazed to see such a young kid doing that. So uh, oh, wow. how did that, like, where did that come from, that that kind of work ethic? Oh, geez. Um, oh, I don't know, man. I, I, I started singing, to back up a little bit, I started singing uh, back with when I was in a cover band because we couldn't find a singer. That's why I started singing. 
and um i kind of liked it you know it's like i could enjoyed it and then i started my own band started the toadies and uh went on and then as far as work ethic goes i mean we were we had a chance to do the record that i always wanted to make and make it sound like i wanted it to sound and then get to go on tour and see the united states and i had barely been out of texas you know so uh it was it was great i was just loving it so it really didn't feel like work that's so cool you know, in the early days yeah 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 so you get signed you drive out to california record rubberneck which ultimately went platinum off of tons of touring on your end mm -hmm. uh you made a bunch of amazing records after rubberneck i mean hell below stars above no deliverance play rock music my like I said, my I'm a huge fan. My own playlist is filled with tons of tracks on those records. But after Rubberneck, at least from what I read, Interscope wasn't supportive or didn't appear to be supportive. Uh, do you have any feeling or do you ever find out why? Um, my understanding of major labels is uh, they are 100% behind you when there's momentum and it's and it's less difficult to to make things happen um so we went out and toured our asses off we got lucky with a couple of pds uh program directors that just played whatever they wanted off the record and um that caused other program directors to start you know playing the record and uh then we kept bothering radio stations we would just barge in and get on the radio, get on the radio. You know, we were on tour with Bush and, uh, when we were in a van, they were in a bus and we would give them a ride to the radio station that they had set up, that their promoter had set up their promotions department. But we would go in with them and say, yeah, we're supposed to go on the air after they get done, which is just oh, a lie. Okay. And <laughs> so uh, that's, that's great. Though. I mean, you hustle it worked a lot. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, then they had to play our song and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, formed a lot of relationships that way and um then you know that the tide turned a little bit and the label got behind it and it took off and uh yeah so that's just my two cents on major labels it's if it's if it's hard to do yeah they're not going to try that hard yeah that makes sense because they have so many acts they're going to invest yeah. their time i guess where the sure. where the fast sure. return is yeah in spite of that you kept on going till 2001 and I was curious, that, that took a lot of balls and courage to do that. What prompted you to keep soldiering on? Because a lot of people would have basically said, hey, man, this is not happening. Let's just wrap it up. Oh, well, you know, it took the once the record came out, the second record, um, you know, I just adopted the same attitude. Like, well, we're just doing this again, except uh, instead of starting in a van, we're starting in a bus. And we already have a leg right. up, so that's going to make it easier. And and so we'll just go do this. And uh, then our bass player quit in the middle of a tour, and that kind of just was the last straw on the whole thing for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it took so long. To, uh, it took a long time to get that second record out, and there was a lot of factors there. I, I I feel like the band, you know, we just had. Well, I can't say we. I had my nose to the grindstone, so I didn't notice years going by like two and a half years of just constant touring and um i just didn't even think about it it's just it's just what i was doing and then i realized oh shit it's time to write a record and i got to sit down and totally change my mindset and get back into writing mode and um so that took some that took some time then we went in in a 98 we went in and recorded a feeler and um had full full authorization and pay and everything to do another record and uh, booked a nice studio. And somehow that just stopped in the middle of the whole process. The label pulled the plug and we started all over again. So uh, yeah, it just sucked. I just, I still don't know why, but uh, uh, anyway, so yeah, the record finally came out in 01 and uh, had one or two reworked songs from the feeler session. Hmm. And uh, yeah, great. Great. In, in in 2006, the band, you reformed the band. I was curious, during that time away, what did you get or what did you learn that allowed you to put things back together with a health, healthy outlook? Oh, um, 
I guess perspective. <laughs> I, uh, I took about a year off in 01, starting in 01. And um, after about a year, because I was like, well, I'm not a musician anymore. I'll just not do that. And I'll just be, be something else. I don't know what yet. And then after about, about a year, I'm like, man, I, I need to do this. I have to do music. I just I have to. So I started a band uh, called the Burden Brothers and uh, out of Dallas. And we did uh, a couple of records and a bunch of EPs and one-offs and st- you know, stuff like that. And toured quite a bit. And that was a lot of fun. And I came home uh, after touring on the second record. And I just sat down and started writing again as I'd gotten in the habit of doing. And uh, the songs I was cranking out were, were coming out real easily. And they just weren't Burden Brothers songs. And I realized they're Toadies songs. Uh, so I called up the guys and they were still around and said, if we can get a bass player in here, let's, you want to do a record? And, you know, at the time we had, uh, uh, that would have been around 06, uh, Toadies were getting offers for, uh, and had were doing a few like music, like radio festivals and stuff like that. So we played together a few times, uh, and I had these songs. So it all kind of worked out. Did it, was it weird when you played together? Or it felt good. Oh, it was like like riding a bike. It's had yeah. anything to say, but it was like it's just everybody's in the pocket and everybody knows what they're doing, and it's just it's cool. That is cool, man. That's yeah. nice. Vaden, I want to talk about some of my favorite Toadies tracks, and I've tried to stay clear of the top hits that you've been asked a thousand questions of. Um, (laughs) But I have so many, it was easy to do that, actually. So Tyler Uh from Rubberneck, I love that track, and the buildup, both musically and lyrically, is just phenomenal. And to me, it was either about a serial killer or a guy that was head over heels in lust with a woman who he's going to have sex with, or at least in his mind, that's what he pictures is going to happen. But then I listened to the Dark Secrets documentary where you talked about this song, and it was a very cool story. So if you don't mind, I'd love you to share the backstory of of that song, Tyler, with the listeners. Yeah, yeah. Well, the origins of that story are uh, start in East Texas when I was a little kid. My grandparents were just uh, like, you know, dirt farmers in East Texas. And, uh, we would go stay out there with them in the country. Just there's nobody around. Just wander around all day long and not see anybody. And uh, and I remember, for some reason, in my twenties, this story just popped up in my mind, and I don't even know where it, you know, why, what reminded me of it. But there was some holiday that we were out there hanging out with the grandparents and sitting around the dinner table. And uh, they were talking about this fella that was uh, that all the farmers were talking about. This guy was walking around looking in windows and like you'd just be watching TV or or going to bed and you'd see him in the window. And like they're telling me this story and I look over to my left and there's a gun rack and I know they're all loaded. And I'm like, what (laughs) insane dipshit is doing that? You know, this can't be, you know, when I look back in my 20s, I'm like, this can't be can't be real probably just some like half crazy old guy saw his reflection you know i don't know but uh but i thought well if that guy is that nutty to go look in those windows like what's in what's going on with that guy you know so i just kind of wrote a story around what i thought what i thought they thought the guy was doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> if now, that makes sense we- no, it makes total sense, and, and it, the lyrics are great. Matches exactly that. But, but so before we we went on the air, you would tell me sometimes you bring characters back. Have you brought that character back? Did you ever bring him back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he goes through uh, he goes through a few st- songs. There's like uh, like five five tunes, <laughs> five songs. They're, yeah, they're all non sequential. They're all like written, not written. Uh, in sequence, if that makes it, yeah, right. What other what what other song is that character? And I'm gonna go back and revisit it. Uh, Jigsaw Girl is uh, kind of an origin story, I guess. Um, and uh, he, yeah, in Jigsaw Girl, this guy is just compelled uh, to uh, well to cut his girlfriend up because he he loves her and he doesn't want to lose her and he thinks he can preserve her. Uh, 
or perfection, you know, ah, which is a theme I, ta- I, I theme that I come back to. I've come back to that a lot of times, trying to preserve something and inadvertently ruining it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So then he's, uh, does that, uh, then, uh, jigsaw girl, which was on the heretics, uh, record, um, is him realizing that he, that he can't have what he wants. And he motors off and goes to, uh, goes to Tyler and has that whole story and uh yeah and continues that's so cool man um one more off no deliverance very scary and kind of ominous vibe musically and again vocally you you really i mean as a listener you get the feeling this guy is like you know if this was your last song and then you dropped dead you'd be like that was a you left your mark you know you're really pushing it on every song which is (laughs) Yeah, well, right. no, it's, cool. it, that, that's great, man. That's as a listener, it, you know, it's like anybody you're, you're, you're working with and any, not that music is work, but when you're, when someone's giving that much, it's like, yeah, you know, you, you respect it more and you're like, it means, it means as a listener, I see how much it means to you. So it's, it transfers to your listeners, you know? Um, but is that about a girl that deals with issues by using? Um, well, I'm not exactly sure, honestly. Real quick, I lo- oh, there you are, you're back. Um, so, uh, I'm, there's an artist uh, called, his name is Ron Muke. Uh, I think that's okay. how you pronounce it. And he uh, does these really oversized, but super detailed uh, sculptures of people. Like okay. if you look him up, uh, M U E K I'm sorry, M U E C K. Um, it's like, there's a baby that looks like a baby laying on the floor, but it's like 15 feet long. It's insane. Like in the detail and everything. So there was a, an exhibit at one of the museums here that I went into and there was just a woman, a pregnant woman, uh, who was, I don't know, 20 feet tall, maybe. And I'm just like, I don't know why that just kind of, just the look on her face and everything, it just kind of spurred all these thoughts. Yeah, that's So I went home and, yeah, wrote that song. Sunshine from Play Rock Music. Killer vocals here, man. My, I was just curious, the lyrics, my hands may be steady, but my heart is in my throat. Is that just about someone's, like, really hot for somebody or <laughs> he was really, in, yeah, really afraid kinda... of talking to her? I, you know, um, th- some people had told me that, that some of these songs are sexy, man. Like the, like people tell me that like Tyler, that's a sexy song. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, so I thought, well, I've, I always try to, uh, challenge myself and come up with new things that I'm going to try to do with music. And I had never tried to write a sexy song or write a song, uh, about a stripper. And so I decided, well, this guy's infatuated with the stripper and, and this is what that song is about. It's just a full on, you know, just a lust. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, the appeal, that's a awesome blues, man. I'm a, I'm a blues fan at heart. That was, I love, I mean, I, I have the chords sitting here in a stack of papers. I was playing to it last week, but, um, what is that song about? Uh, that's kind of a long, it's a long story, but, uh, uh, without, well, I don't know my dad, it's about my dad. So okay. my dad is a, is a retired preacher and, uh, and he was driven to do his thing and I was driven to do my thing. And those two things were contrary and drove us apart. And, uh, that. so that's what that song is basically like. Okay, I get it. You know, I understand why you feel, you know, why we split and um and have this uh wall between us. I get that. Uh and I'm I'm cool with you if you can be cool with me. Let's just fucking get by yeah. that, you know. So that's what that whole song is trying to process. 
Wow, that's pretty cool. Did, you don't have to answer this if you're not comfortable. Did, did you guys ever, ever able to reconcile? We kind of just, yeah, agreed to just not talk about it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's, uh, he's, his mind is gone. So every time I'm around, he's like, uh, so, uh, what church are you going to? And I'm like, uh, oh, dad, come on. We've been over this. And you know, so yeah, he doesn't remember that he's just asked. I that, just went like, through that, times. man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, I just went through. Yeah. yeah wow. That's a, it's yeah, a weird, that's the way uh, it is sometimes, man. Yeah. So things you don't, uh, expect in life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Um, when, in, there's one lyric in the song that reminded me of something. You say chasing our demons and feeding that fire inside. Uh, I, I've saw there's a documentary on David Geffen, and he said something in there, man, that was really interesting. He said, you know, we all have these voices in our heads, and you don't want to hear them sometimes, or well, most of the time, and when they're there, uh -huh. you know, they're, and they're never like, hey, man, you're awesome. I know you could do that. You know, the voices are always like, Hey man, you're an asshole. This is going to be fucked up. And right. So, yeah. uh, so what he said was he was going to therapy like every day, you know, I guess when you're like that rich, you have to go every day or something. I don't know. Uh -huh, but, yeah. uh, and he everybody said, he was should. talking. Well, yeah, everybody should, sure. <laughs> absolutely. You kidding me? Uh, yeah. and, and he, he said his therapist told him something about the voices and he goes, look, I can't eliminate. It's not possible to get rid of the voices, but you can learn to not listen to them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's a good perspective. And then I was talking about it with someone and they said when, when they have these voices, they actually invite them in like, Hey man, come sit down. You know, like I hear you. I know what you're saying, you know, and that's kind of cool too, because it's like, it's this now it's not confrontational. And yeah. if you're going to yeah. mask. Yeah. So I heard that recently too. So I'm always trying to, you know, fix some broken shit, you know? So it, uh, oh, yeah, sort of for that, sure. that's what your song reminded me of that. So great track. Yeah. And that, you know, uh, feeding the fire inside. That's just like, I know he's driven to do what he does. And I, just as I'm driven to do what I do, you know? Yeah. So it's like, that's, that's just what it is. And neither one of us understand the first thing about the other one. So, yeah. You know, I, I totally get it. Yeah. I, I have, let me ask. I, I heard many times from musicians in all, because I've had close to 900 guests. So I've had guys in all different genres and all walks of life that grew up like that with religion. And a mm -hmm. lot of them have told me as adults that they were really uncomfortable with the fear and the terror that the religion they grew up with was put into them. Right. And, they, and, mm -hmm. and they also have a sense of anger and discomfort with the image of the fire and brimstone God that they were handed as a child versus, you know, the loving God or the forgive, forgiving God or higher power that they have embraced as an adult. Um, and, and you talked a little bit about it, but any other thoughts that you have on that? And, and again, if you're not comfortable talking with that, it's not a problem. But. No, no. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. That's uh, uh, the last song that I wrote uh, for uh, the rubberneck, the first record, the most recent song when we went in the studio was backslider. And that's, it's about that exact topic. And, you know, it's uh, trying to deal with like, well, this is a nine year old kid who's dealing with, uh, going to hell you know what the fuck is that all about why why would you put that on a kid you yeah. know is that necessary? why would you put that on anybody uh yeah but um yeah uh, so that's what that song is about and i mean that's just a current a theme that just keeps coming back too i i forgot to forgot to mute my phone sorry oh, um, no worries so yeah that's a theme that keeps you know coming back it's just uh i don't know uh, no, it's a common theme for lots of people, man. And it yeah, really is and my, you know, my something... take on, yeah, my take on religion is it's all, it's all a club. Any, any religion is just a club where you try to fit in, you know? Yeah. And if you're from Texas, you're going to be a Baptist. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. If my dad had been born in the middle of a desert in Afghanistan, he would be exactly the same guy. He would just say different shit. Yeah. You know, right. you'd use different you. terms for whatever's going on up there. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. I hear so, you. um, that's just what I think about the whole thing. I think it's a big club and it gets, uh, you know, I agree. It's mani- manipulative and does its thing. That's what it does. Yeah. It's pretty divisive too, which is uncomfortable, which is unnecessary, which is contrary to what you think the whole thing's about, which is weird. So uh, exactly. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate exactly. you sharing that. Vaden, a lot of your music is ultimately rooted in blues, even though the actual style of the song for the most, the songs for the most part are usually pretty far from blues. I was curious who your blues influences are and how did you come up with weaving the blues into this, you know, uh, indie hard rock uh, band that you have? Yeah. I, I, I don't have any good stories about blues, (laughs) the blues. I, uh, I grew up listening to, um, well, in my, when my parents' car was either nothing or country or bluegrass. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what I listened to to begin with. And I, you know, love that stuff too. Um, then of course, being around Texas, being from Texas, I like all I had access to was the radio when I was a kid. Of course, there was nothing on TV. There was no going to a show, of course, you know, in Fort Worth. And, um, uh, there, my, version of the blues is white guy blues like uh, ZZ Top and some Zeppelin songs that kind of stuff that's like that's how I was exposed to the blues not not directly but indirectly by uh you know yeah. rock radio I guess but it's a, a lot of it is like musically compositionally it's a lot of blues structure in there it's it's interesting that that's that's that you didn't grow well, up man there's blues. a there's a whole uh if you if you take apart one four five, which is blues, I mean that's every pop song ever. Yeah. You know, it's just it's in there, and um, so I have a lot of fun. I still do have a lot of fun with taking that structure and upending it, or flipping it, or or shifting it around. You know what I mean? Where they're still the yeah. same. You know, you get to five, and it's like, oh shit, here we go. And you go back to one, and it's like <laughs> that's that's the payoff. You know, and it's yeah. like you can. It's fun doing that without a five. Yeah, you know, getting all music. That is, now. <laughs> that is true. When you get to five, the one is the payoff. That's so funny that Hell you yeah. said that. Yeah. Uh, what what was what would you say the top three musical experiences you had? Oh, geez, um, man. Uh, getting out on tour. Uh, there was one tour where we were. Um, opening for the red hot chili peppers and they were doing, they were doing like four shows a week in stadiums and we would fill in the gaps with our own shows on the, cause you know, we don't want a day off. And, um, and coincidentally there was a band called Brainiac who, uh, was on, uh, grass records with us early on. And we'd seen them back in New York and in New Jersey and they're just crazy cool crazy cool and they were playing like we would get uh we'd either come from the stadium uh with the peppers or from a a theater or you know venue of that kind of size to a little bit smaller like a bar and we would just hop in a cab and go across town to see those guys like we get to see them like a couple times a week it was just the same routing you know yeah and uh and that that was those guys are just fucking awesome they were awesome uh and just seeing those shows just the energy and the weirdness and just the just the guy loose singer just lost himself in what he was doing it was just it was magic that's, what kind of that's, music was that what kind oh of music it, that? oh god i don't i don't even know <laughs> i'm gonna check the brainiac uh, i'm gonna check them out they, yeah and every record was different and um but uh they they were crazy. The guy had a, they had guitar, bass, and drums. And then the singer had uh, this weird little, like, realistic from Radio Shack, you know, keyboard. <laughs> realistic. And, uh, God, I haven't heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and he would, like, get on a shitty little stand, and he had a microphone. And I think he had another microphone that ran into the keyboard through all these weird effects until it just sounded like, robot noise you know what i mean 
Yeah. And he would, they would just start cooking and he would like one point come over the top of the keyboard into the crowd and just like, it was insane. It was fucking awesome. It was magic. I want to look that into like, those guys. That was like the most, the coolest thing in the nineties for me was watching Brainiac. That that's a good. That must have been opening for the uh, Chili Peppers. That must have been good for you guys because that's a very compatible audience. Oh yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, they, yeah. we had a we had a um, great response at those shows, and uh, that was when Dave Navarro was on that record, and he was on that right. tour, and uh, he he told me that that's the reason that we were on the tour because he was getting a tattoo and listening to Rubberneck and wanted to have us out. And oh, that's he actually awesome. came out. Yeah, yeah. He actually came out and uh, played guitar on, uh, I think it was Mr. Love. Yeah, Mr. Love. That's and, very uh, cool. Like in front of all those people, Dave Navarro come out and play my guitar. I'm like, fucking hey, man. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. W- what else? Give me number two. Top, mu- top musical experiences you've had. Uh, <laughs> so we had a, a tour manager uh, for a long time, uh, Marky Ray. Hi, Marky, if you're watching. Uh, and... Um, we were in the middle of the, you know, all these tours were just unending. They were just, just, and you kind of lose your mind and, and everything. <laughs> so, uh, the, we played a show, I think we had a day off or we played early. I cannot recall, but, um, he said, Hey, uh, PJ Harvey, he knew we loved PJ Harvey. She is playing, uh, I believe it was on her first record that she was playing at this, uh, radio festival at some big, you know, big corporate you know, the, you know, those big stadiums, like outdoor music venue, you know what I mean? Yep. And uh, amphitheater type situation. And uh, we were like, yeah, but we don't have, uh, we don't have tickets. And he pulled up his Lammy and he goes, yeah, you do. Ah. <laughs> and so, so we all put our Lammies on and just walked right the fuck in past security, you know, to get into the venue, the right. big gated venue. Then past the other security to go backstage, just waving a lammy. Oh my right god! Up by the monitors, right by the monitor board. That's like so cool. Which is what twenty a, feet that away. Sound from P- is fucking a. Yeah. Twenty feet away from PJ Harvey, and like wow, there's all the people <laughs> out there, and like, and she did her thing, and it was crazy and cool, and then she was done. And we were like, well, we're not interested in any of these other guys, so we just fucking split. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Always good to get into a, a concert or any a stadium unauthorized, man. You know. Yeah, you know, it's no funny. I don't think I real, I, and I don't think I realized even that it happened so quickly that I don't think I realized until we were leaving that we were not even supposed to be there. I'm like, I thought maybe he knew a guy. Some that, that like, <laughs> yeah, it's just it was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. Good security. <laughs> good security there, huh? Um, uh, yeah. And what would <laughs> What would be number three? <laughs> oh, um, not that long ago. I think it was right before uh, the pandemic. It had been 18 or 19. Um, Robert Plant played in Dallas over here uh, at, a, uh, at a kick-ass music venue that holds three or 4,000 people. It's not that big. And um, my manage I can't remember if my wife bought the tickets or if my management got us hooked up, but we had – like a little booth, like off to the side on the, in the balcony. And I thought, well, he's going to come out and he's going to do like, you know, whatever he does. I don't give a shit. He's one of my favorite singers. Let him do whatever. Yeah. And, um, cause I do no research. I'm the worst at this kind of stuff. I, <laughs> I do zero research. So, uh, but as I learned, once we sat down is that he's going to come out and do uh Led Zeppelin songs. Uh, but like the original demo version of those songs. Oh, cool. And um, so it was like not the instrumentation exactly that was on the record, but sort of the way they had flushed it out. And it was, it was, it was awesome. That's, that's a good show. So was he, who's with a, like an acoustic band or like a, was it uh, a little of band? both. I can't remember okay. what they were called, a planetary something. I can't remember what they were called, but uh, they had everything from the traditional like rock and roll gear to like a uh, Zydeco gear and, uh, okay. and, and, uh, in like, uh, uh, just rudimentary, like, uh, uh, band, like, um, pre banjo stuff, you know what I mean? Like stringed instruments sure. that were like made out of a tree, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was really cool, but 
to see Robert Plant, like the band comes out and then Robert Plant comes out and did that thing where he holds the mic and kicks the bottom of the mic stand and it spins all the fuck away around. And I'm like, oh, oh no, man. here we go. That's yeah, like, he's oh, like what seventy seven, yeah. He, he was killing. close to eighty back then, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Uh, man. Anyway, that was a uh, that was constant goosebumps. That whole show. That's very cool. Thank you, man. Van, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with in in life, and how'd you get through them? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> Pull out your notebook. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> jeez, I don't know, man. Um, I, I've, uh, um, I've got a condition, so my, I'm I'm going to be all up or all down. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of learning how to deal with that. So if you ask me to to pick the low, I'm like, which one? Right. <laughs> you know, right. How yeah, far yeah. back do you want to go? Sure. So, um, sure. So. Uh, but anyway, I've got some meds, and that's all getting better. So since everybody wants to know way too much about me, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, early on it was like um, just you know drinking and uh, drugs and all the typical shit. You know, yeah. I'm really, I you know I am beside myself that I lived through the '90s. I'm just stunned, just amazed. Yeah, well, good for you that you did. Did you like it? I'm, I'm, if, if you don't want to answer this, cool. You can tell me to fuck off. Did you get sober or did you just like chill out or? I just chilled out. Yeah. I learned okay. that. Yeah. You know, I'll have some beers and uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. And well, you're lucky you could do that. Cause a lot of people can't, it's either, you know, zero or a hundred. Right. You know, so it's fortunate that you're able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me the, uh, Let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Most of the photos and that I've seen of you and videos, you're playing vintage Gibsons. Yeah. But I was curious, what's your go-to guitar right now, and has that changed over the years? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm gonna refill this because I'm a thirsty guy. Um, yeah, still I do a. Uh, I think it's a '77 reissue uh, SG. I believe yeah. is the one that I play on stage. Uh, but I'm not picky. I'll play any SG really pretty much. Um, uh, there's a, we were on tour a few years ago and somebody knocked over one of my SGs and broke the neck, yeah. you know, and like, so I just, we were in Philadelphia and I like uh, looked at my phone. There's a music store around the corner and I called him like, yeah, we got an SG. So I walked over there, bought a used one and came back. And that's one of my favorites. It's just a eighties era thick neck sg but um uh yeah on stage uh back in the day there was an l6s like which was like 73 i think and uh and uh that one i have had several other l6s since then and i still have that one but um that one just sounds sounds different and at one point i took the back plate off of it and there's about a half pound of solder <laughs> where, the, uh, where somebody did some mad scientist shit and like, I don't know what's going on, but I just put the pl plate back on and left it. Cause it sounds great. None that's of my other guitars job. sound that way. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. That's really wild. What What do you typically, you play that same stuff in the studio? Uh, I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got, uh, yeah, several Gibsons. I got a, a couple of Gretsch, uh, Malcolm Young Gretsches and, uh, Got a Fender, uh, what's that? A uh, whatever kind of Fender. I don't know Fenders, but uh, yeah. <laughs> mostly Gibsons. Um, got a gold top and a couple of Gibson acoustics that I love. And yeah, do you have a favorite song that you wrote? Um, probably Rattler's Revival which I believe is on play rock music. Um, what about it? Makes yeah, it my favorite. Uh, that one is uh, just expressing the desire of, uh, man, I sure wish I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but like, uh, you know, you haven't, you haven't, lo you haven't given less fucks as you've gotten older. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, like, like if I'm uh, like specifically this, this 
I, I was having one of those low points right. back in the day, and I am walking out of a liquor store with a handle of vodka and a case of beer. Like, I'm on a goddamn <laughs> mission, right? <laughs> and so, like, like seriously, when a, like, I'm like... When a, when a half gallon of vodka is not enough. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. So uh, I'm like, you know, t- tomorrow might come, tomorrow might not come. I don't give a fuck. I'm getting hammered. So I... For- was in that right. low point and I'm getting in the car and this guy pulls in kind of next to me or sideways and like, Hey man, like, yeah. Hey, I just didn't. And he goes, we went to high school together and I did not remember this guy. And I was not in the mindset to be Mr. PR or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, cool. Good to see you. And I thought I did it. I thought I was fine. You know, yeah. I thought I'm like, well, I got to get going, man. Good to see you again later. All right. Bye. And nothing. And then he goes online. He goes, this guy's a dick. He became a dick. He became famous, became a dick. Oh, and my like, God. Oh, what the hell? And so uh... I'm like, you know, and so I'm like, you know, I wish that didn't bother me. What, yeah. you know, wouldn't it be great to like it just be cold as fuck? And that didn't bother me. And so that's I sat down and wrote that song kind of based on that. Uh, it's, that... You know, this shit pops up all the time, right? It's like, why, uh, why does that bother me? But if you could just turn that off and have the heart of a snake. You know, it's like, <laughs> so, that's your next uh, song, I just thought heart of a snake. Yeah, well, yeah, that's in the, <laughs> that's the line, man. It's like, uh, yeah, I took on kind of a, an evangelist, uh, type attitude about it. Like, come on yeah. over here, man. We don't give a shit. Fuck everybody else. You can turn it off and be one of us and it's all going to be cool. And that's what that song is. Yeah. About. Yeah. <laughs> man, I think, I don't know. I think it's so social media. I don't know what it is. Everybody's so like, um, you know uh, it's me oriented like he, you like you know you heard his feel you know maybe you had something to do i mean i'm like i don't i don't even get why people pay me personally i don't pay attention to any of that shit you know right like i don't care yeah. what someone else not you you know any i don't care what someone else it's none of my business you know like right. it, it, you know i it, and i do that for me because it's less pressure you know, like, fuck, I don't have yeah. to think, you know, if, if you're having exactly, a bad, yeah. like, well, what do I care? And, and not to be rude, but like, you know, not, none of my business, you know, I got my own shit to deal with and I'm trying to yeah. manage. You Somebody's know? being a dick in traffic or, or the, the checker at whatever grocery store is being a dick or whatever. It's like, I've just kind of realized, you know, you got something going on. This isn't me. Yeah. Not and my I'm just, problem. And it really, it really <laughs> takes the stress out of life. You know what I mean? Because oh otherwise, God. it just generates more animosity. It really does. That's why I did it. I was like, holy shit. I, I got to a point and I said, you know, I've got, I realized a lot of the stress in my life was because of me. And I'm like, yeah. I got to fix, I've got to fix this shit. I'm not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm can't do this forever, man. You know, I'm fucking halfway yep. there. Maybe more. I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> worst, worst gig ever. <laughs> Besides oh, meeting man. that guy in the uh, parking lot. <laughs> okay there's a i think it was in sacramento somewhere in california in southern california and we were playing a radio show with uh oh my god it just escaped me the guy that does entertainment tonight now um oh my god the van just uh escaped me but uh we were in a van and they were opening for us and they pulled up in a deluxe top notch bus <laughs> like money like right. they had gotten the label support and so uh and we're playing this weirdly improvised show at uh Paradise Beach Club right okay. so we get in and it it's just a bar it's not a rock and roll club it's a bar and there's a small stage where when it was built originally, that was probably where go-go dancers were right. like a real small stage elevated. It's like eight or 10 feet up behind the bar. Like there's oh. the bar where people are getting drinks and we're behind it. And you're playing behind it. Jeez. And in like, in like trying not to fall into the bar. And, uh, and so anyway, the, um, yeah, it's going to come to me as soon as I get off the, get off this chat with you what that band is but uh um sugar ray boom sugar okay, ray there you go yeah 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 so uh sugar ray gets done and they come back there's a tiny little dressing room which really is just like a broom closet just a shitty little thing 
and they're like, but they put some sofas in there and uh and they were like man the the crowd is great but security are being dicks they're beating people up and they're hurting people and i'm like oh no that's not good we we don't have any of that we won't have any of that and so we went on and we are uh way more aggressive than sugar ray as you can yeah. you know yes. you can picture yes so um so i thought this isn't gonna go well because i know how security guards that don't know what rock and roll is don't know how to deal with rock and roll crowds they're just meatheads and they hurt people so um before we even started i said uh security these guys are not basically they're not trying to hurt you they're just jumping around just let them have fun just be cool or we won't be able to do our job and so we played, I really think, three awesome songs. Too. Well, we played like three songs, and people were getting chokehold, choke held, or whatever you call it, and like, like hurt. You could see people getting hurt and beat up by the security. So I just stopped. And I went, "Okay, we're done. We're not playing anymore until you fucking security stop beating people up." And they turned on us. And so we wow. came off stage and got. They were now we are the bad guy. And so I find myself in a chokehold and getting thrown up against a wall. And it was insane. I finally got outside the club. There's an emergency exit right by the stage. I got outside the club and there's people just falling out of the club. Like just, it Holy was insane. Shit. And I opened the door back up. Like it's gotta be calmed down. And I saw fucking bar stools flying. It was, it was like a cartoon. So, uh, Holy shit. so yeah, we just like, Oh my God. And like all of our stuff's in there. And we only have a van. We don't even really have anywhere to hide from this shit. So, so we uh, eventually wound up back in the dressing room and locked the door until the chaos subsided. Oh and, my! Uh, I've yeah. never heard anything like that. It was fucking crazy. Oh my god! Holy, that's like yeah. a stampede or something. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit! Hey, tell me your top three desert island discs no no particular order and just for this moment because that changes all the all time. right man uh let's see what i think i yeah i had to make a note everybody um, does that's like the toughest question of yeah. all the questions you know not like your fucked up childhood or your nut nutty relationships or whatever or your divorce no it's like let me focus yeah. on my yeah, top well, it's like cd <laughs> <laughs> it's like the record store syndrome when you walk in and you forget what you're shopping for, but you never forget yeah. what fucked you up as a kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How <it's> true. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, man. Touche. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, uh, Budos band, Budos band oh, yeah. up from the side. They are you killer. Go. Some funky stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I love it, man. It's like, um, it's like the soundtrack soundtrack from the best 70s spy movie you know yeah what I mean? it's just yeah. killer uh then uh rid of me by pj harvey would be up there that's all just just rock and roll just so good and what then it'd be you know the three? yeah the anchor would be the way back would be highway to hell yeah that just shaped so much of, you know, speaking of blues, going all the way back to that, that whole record, like, and earlier than that, like, old Bon Scott era ACDC was just bluesy, having fun, just a kid's just having fun. Oh, and it's was like, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, and people got so afraid of it because it was highway to hell, ah, but it, if you listen to it, they're just fucking around and having fun and just having to write funny lyrics and just, it was just just a blast. Someone once said they were they were ACDC was like the met, the hard rock version of Chuck Berry, and I think that's very accurate description. Actually, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No. Hey, tell me one or two things you've done, or one or two changes you made that have had the biggest impact on you or on your life. Uh, well, I mentioned before, but uh, cleaning up really helped. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah just working on uh, uh self esteem and self awareness and all that stuff you know it's uh it's it's a weird thing self esteem cuz you can get like you know when back when i was super famous and still like the like the voices that we were talking about earlier yeah. uh, they're <laughs> they still don't like go you away. Know, deserve, 
yeah, no, <laughs> you don't deserve all this. You don't right. really do this for a living, you know? And uh, so learning how to mitigate that with, uh, you know, like support system and, you know, all like that's that a tough one, Matt. Yeah. I guess yeah. on that. Thank you for sharing that. This is, yeah, man. <laughs> this is a tough question, man. What do you like and dislike most about yourself? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> but um, um, right after the self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, uh, I am motivated to do, I like that I'm motivated to do music and projects and stuff, but goddamn getting them started is that's, <laughs> that's the flip. It's like just getting something started is like the, the, the that's the hard thing. Yeah. You know, well, you know there's, they, 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 there is different people. There are some people that are good at getting stuff started and some people that are, you know, there's starters and finishers, basically. Right, there, right. There is a distinct difference. And, you know, they always say if you get it, if you're a good starter, you better get, make sure you're working with someone that can be a good finisher. Right, right. Yeah, I try to like, like, especially when I'm writing or really when I'm whatever it is, I try to set a time where I sit down and make my, okay, this is work time and just shut off all the internet and everything else. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that works sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Best childhood memory. Oh, uh, oh, I guess back on that farm, just running around and being like, just loose. Kids used to now just we... run around loose. <laughs> Isn't that fucking crazy? No, man, because there's no responsibility. It's not crazy at all. It's like, <laughs> I mean, like, how being what was your yeah, I mean, eight or 10 years old? Yeah. Eight or 10 years old on a farm surrounded by just woods and who knows what. And like, uh, just go out there and come back when it gets dark. Yeah. You know, I got to ask you, we are from the Bronx. So I don't know anything about uh, this. Is it, when you said a dirt farm, what does that mean? Uh, crops for money. Like okay. So they, or, they rent, so they rent out the farm. No, Rent no, the they they own the farm, and whatever they can pull out of the ground is what they make. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, gotcha. so my uh, I was one summer where I was literally picking cotton, which is the worst thing in the world, and uh, uh, and then peas, uh, carrots, watermelon. I actually learned recently that my dad, uh, when he decided he wanted to go to seminary to be a preacher, uh. My grandfather said, uh, gave him half of the year's take on the crops, which is like, I'd never do that until like about wow. a month ago. But, uh, that's why. anyway, so that's what they did. They would put it all in the truck and haul it off. And they had a couple of cows, but not, not for anything other than to have them around. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. You know, uh, yeah. I read something years ago and they said the best people to hire are people that where their parents had a business and they worked in it or people that worked on a farm because those Makes are the sense. two most de demanding, you know, you get someone who's been in either of those situations, they know how to work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Uh, let's see. I don't I guess um, as, aside from the um, the foundation of classic rock and whatever I could get on the radio, that's kind of what informed my early years. There was a, a a stint between about eighty-five to ninety, eighty-five to eighty-eight probably, where um, I heard the Talking Heads, and that changed everything for me. Yeah. It just changed everything, and. Um, like here's a whole song with no guitar solo and there is another <laughs> song where there's a different piece of music for every verse. I'm like, what the, wow. I never heard anything like it. And, um, and then after that was the Pixies mm -hmm. and, uh, they just continued that, you know, that progression. So, uh, yeah, just that, uh, that weird, uh, skewed view of looking at, uh, at rock and roll. Just yeah, well, I, from I could them. see, I could hear, I could see those, I could hear them in your, I mean, it's different music, but you can hear that influence, except you're much, you know, you're 
tough. You're rock and roll, man. You know, you're tougher. Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Um, not a ton. I do, uh, um, you know, I do some reading and I do a bunch of number puzzles and just any kind of number puzzle I get my hands on. And, uh, I was doing some woodworking for a while, but then I became overly, uh, paranoid about losing a finger. Oh, dude, I, that's not unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's not <laughs> you got a giant yeah. saw in front of you you only got 10 fingers yeah and, you know you kind of need them yeah, all yeah. to play guitar <laughs> i hear <laughs> you man hey just a couple of questions left and i just want to thank you so much for all your time and thank you for a lifetime of great yeah, music man. uh most fun thing you've ever done most fun thing yeah oh geez i don't know man traveling with my friends that's uh my wife and i go on these trips with uh this couple here in Fort Worth and we've been, that's always a blast. We just did Martha's, not Martha's, uh, Napa Valley, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I didn't, I, I'm not a wine drinker. I, I like wine, but, uh, but it turned out to be one of the funnest things I've ever done. Just walking. Really? What did you like about it? Cause my and, wife's trying to get me to do that. And I'm not a oh, wine man, guy. I don't know. It's just, it, I highly recommend it. Okay. I don't know. Also, I don't know if you like if you're into edibles or not, but they're legal there. So that that's oh, another I know. thing. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so yeah, just walking around like a it's it's like um oh I don't know grown ups Disneyland or whatever. It's just you know cool little street and there's great food. The food ah so good, real good wine. They have the, boutique Napa. beer places and all kinds of stuff and yeah. That was a, that's a lot of fun. We've done New Orleans with those guys a couple of times, uh, Vegas a few times with them, um, San Francisco. They're just great people to hang out with. Oh, that's cool, man. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. We, we went to California and uh, so we're going to a dispensary because here it's only like medical, right? right. And uh, we, we come out we, we, with this giant basket of shit, right? And... <laughs> We're here. So, you know, all our kids are adults and we show it to them and they're like, what are you guys going to do with that? We're like, I don't know. I guess it'll last a while. <laughs> Cause we, we not, you know, we don't really do that a lot. It's like a one-off, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know? And, uh, but it was just such a novelty, like, Oh, let's get one of these. You know, it was just really fun. It was just so a buying experience was really weird. So I guess that's why we, uh -huh. we went a little nuts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My, sure. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, uh, wife, oh, we stopped, uh, on the way from the airport, like the, we flew into San Francisco when we we're going to Napa and it's like an hour and a half drive to, right. from the airport. Right. So we pull in and of course the first thing we do is find a dispensary. Right. And so yeah. pull into that right by the airport. My buddy goes in, he comes out, his wife takes over driving and hour and a half later we get, we get into <laughs> the hotel and, and, uh, and I'm getting out of the car. I'm kind of like, just uh, ready to get, start vacation, spend an hour and a half in the car. And he gets out of the car and he goes, man, that, what was that? 20 minutes of a drive? <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be a fun trip, man. <laughs> Those edibles are really different, aren't they? They are. They're, they're not like, yeah, yeah. like smoking or anything. It's really different for me anyway. Yeah. It is, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it, it is, it <laughs> seems more powerful. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old, man. Um, yeah. Well, we had a lot of fun, man. That's awesome, man. Last question. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And where do you, was that change intentional or a part of it, natural part of aging? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that one. Over the last 10 years. Uh, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that one. No worries, man. Any final words of I wisdom? Um, I guess if anybody's going to ask me for words of wisdom, I would say, uh, just be nice to yourself, man. Start there and then do it to other people too, but not just right on, to other man. people. Start being nice to yourself. Yeah, man. You can't be nice to others on any other way, man. That was great. Thank yep. you.
Hey, uh, thank you very much. Let me tell people what's going on in your world, and I like people to participate. All right, so the Rubberneck Tour is happening right now. So uh, yeah. please go to uh, Kirtland Records, K-I-R-T-L-A-N-D Records, and the, all the tours posted there. I'm assuming it's probably on the Toadies website as well. If right. you are in – you're in Fort Worth. Is that where you, you're in Fort Worth? Where's the loop? Is that in Fort Worth? Yeah, yeah, I okay. live in Fort Worth. If you're in the Fort Worth area and you're a musician or an artist and you want a very cool place to rehearse and practice at really, really reasonable rates, check out Vaden's place. It's called The Loop, and you can find it online at thelooptx.com, as in Texas, so it's thelooptx.com. Also, uh, Vaden has got involved in some comics. You want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, yeah, like uh, just before... Um the lockdown uh i had started working on um on a comic and i've i've i'm not really a super visually oriented guy but there's a few songs that a few and a little storyline that i had built up through the years that i could just see being it would work well as a graphic you know not graphic yeah, novel comic. i call them right yeah graphic novel yeah. yeah so uh so yeah i started doing that and uh we've got uh, it's it's a story arc, which is really a circle. Um, once you see the last one and the first one, you'll understand what I mean. But there's five issues. Uh, the fifth one is in the works right now. The fourth one just came out. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got it. Where did I put it? Yeah, man, let's right get a here. visual here. Yeah, yeah. So there's like, I uh, got the whole thing here. Wow, there it is. Yeah, Jigsaw Girl. And then... Uh, the, Queen of Scars, uh, just doing this whole thing, and then this Tyler, is awesome. And then uh, I burn, I burn, and, yeah. That's and then so the cool. last what, one will be out. Yeah. What's the last Go one? Ahead. Can you say? Uh, Possum Kingdom is going to be the last one. Oh, that's yeah. very cool. Interesting. But um, but it's um, I almost didn't want to number them because like uh, it, it, it's when you get to the end of that, of the four, fifth one, it starts the first one again. And it's like a, I love stories like that where it's like, yeah. where did this actually start? You know? Yeah. It's very cool. And you can yeah. uh, check those comics out at Kirtland records merch store. So I'm going to give you the link for that. It's store dot Kirtland records, K I R T is in Thomas Kirtland records.com. And there'll be on there. When is the fifth one coming out for the end? Of this year? Uh, I don't know exactly with, uh, Supply chain issues, we it's just hard to say. But okay. Well, probably not out. before the end of the tour. Yeah. Okay. And also follow the band on Instagram, Toadies. Uh anything anything you want to anything else you want to promote or talk about? Uh I think that's about it, man. I'm looking okay. forward to getting out on the road and uh I just learned uh yesterday that uh, a good number of these shows are already sold out. So I'm just that's I'm stoked, you know. I'm, That's awesome. I'm always, uh, I'm always pleasantly surprised when people uh, show up to our shows because I've just, you know, I've been doing this so long that I'm like, you know, people still pay attention, and that's good. I'm, I'm always surprised by that. <laughs> Especially well, dude, you as have a huge catalog of tunes. Oh uh, yeah, catalog of great. You have a lot of great tunes, man. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, and, right, and we'll, also we're working on yeah. new material too. So we might, you might hear some of that if you come out to this tour too. Probably will actually. That's awesome, man. That's very cool. I look yeah. forward to that. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this, please share it on your uh, socials with your friends. Thanks to Vaden Todd Lewis for a lifetime of good music and for being a, a cool guy and talking to us. And uh, most important, be nice to yourself, but remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play a guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Baden, thanks for everything, brother. Awesome. Thank you, man.